Good afternoon, everyone. Nice to see you still here, refreshed, uh, on the afternoon of day two. Um, and thank you to the organizers for inviting the Global Battery Alliance to um, share some of our work in this interesting event. Um, before we dive further, let's do a little post-coffee uh, stretching exercise. How many of you have heard of the Global Battery Alliance before? Can I have a show of hands? Great. Okay, quite a few. Um, well, nevertheless, to those of you who might be less familiar with the GBA, let's start with a bit of um, history. Um, the Global Battery Alliance was founded in 2017 by nine founding members on the twin realization that um, in order to meet the Paris climate targets and to electrify the energy and transport system, uh, we were going to need to scale up battery production at a massive scale. Um, two to five times more minerals needed to fuel this transition, uh, more than 100 new gigafactories, a 17-fold growth of the industry. These are just some of the figures that we keep citing, and we've been citing them throughout this conference as well. Um, at the same time, there were going to be salient risks and negative impacts on the environment, on social issues, and on governance from this rapid scale-up of uh, battery production. Some of these risks are also quite familiar. In the media, we've heard of the risk of child labor in the cobalt value chain, etc. But actually, many of them are systemic in nature and cannot be done away with just by de-risking, meaning changing to another country or another mineral. For example, um, over half of the critical minerals needed for the energy trans transition um, are located in or near indigenous people's lands, and inevitably extraction of those minerals will have an impact on the livelihoods of those people. Um, some of these same Geographical locations are also some of the world's most biodiverse and sensitive environments, the rainforests from the Amazon to the Congo Basin to Indonesia. And these are the world's lungs. So um, in order to scale up battery production, we don't want to actually uh, cut our uh, natural carbon um, absorption mechanisms either. And battery production um, and electric vehicle production itself is going to have a carbon footprint. So, uh, we're really faced with the challenge of not only making the energy transition happen, but making it happen in a sustainable way. And uh, today, from the nine founding members, our membership has grown to 150 organizations that are committed to this shared mission, and they represent um, uh, companies all along the battery value chain, as well as public sector organizations and non-governmental organizations. And many of you are, of course, here in the room today. So, the GBA members have um, together elaborated a vision for just circular and low-carbon battery value chains. But these value chains are typically opaque and complex, spanning the globe by nature. So a first step towards achieving this vision was going to be transparency. We need more data, more info information in order to um, measure the impacts and the risks of this um, scale up of battery value chains um, and eventually manage those risks. And this is where the battery passport comes in. It is a tool for consistently reporting on the sustainability performance of the different steps along the battery value chain. And this is really the GBA's unique value proposition and, and theory of change. Um, in addition to the battery passport, the GBA also convenes dialogue across our members um, and external stakeholders on important issues like critical minerals and circularity. So, Let's have a closer look at the battery passport. Um, the battery passport is a um, digital twin of the physical battery. 
What does this mean in practice? Um, the battery passport is comprised of three types of data. Material provenance data, so which minerals and other materials go into your battery and where are they coming from? Cobalt, lithium, nickel, etc. Um, technical labeling and usage data, so which model is your battery, where was it manufactured, um, has it been already repurposed or recycled, for example. And importantly, consistent reporting against sustainability performance indicators, which are defined by um, the GBA members. And based on this sustainability reporting, um, the GBA battery passport will then issue an ESG score or a quality seal for each battery at the product level. And ultimately, we hope to be able to do that also at the company level. Um, so this is the concept. And in order to prove that this is not just a theoretical exercise, but it can be implemented in practice, um, in January this year, at the World Economic Forum meeting, we launched um, the world's first proof of concept for a battery passport. This proof of concept was uh, delivered through three pilots consisting of the cradle-to-gate battery value chains of two OEMs, Audi and Tesla. These value chains worked together um, with different technological solution providers to aggregate the data um, and put it into the battery passport prototype, showing that the GBA's battery passport is agnostic to different technologies. Um, we work with different solution providers to actually implement the aggregation and the reporting. Furthermore, these um, pilot passports um, showed for the first time that it is possible to combine material provenance data with an ESG score or a calculated index. We did this using a partial ESG score on three pilot issues of child labor, human rights, and greenhouse gas emissions um, to illustrate that this is possible. And this pilot already uh, created some valuable insights to the participants of these pilot projects. You can familiarize yourselves with these pilot reports and uh, the scorecards on our website. And it's actually quite an interesting view to what the battery, battery passport can deliver once it's fully implemented. Um, I want to spend a moment talking about our ESG rule books, because these are really the core of uh, what the GBA delivers. They define a common language for what sustainability means in the context of the full battery value chain. And based on this common language, agreed upon by the different stakeholders, um, this allows defining specific performance metrics for each ESG issue or risk, and then define specific indicators to report upon and calculate um, and index with. Um, so as I mentioned, we have already developed three pilot rule books on child labor, human rights, and greenhouse gas emissions, and are right now launching uh, the second wave of indicator development for another set of four issues on forced labor, indigenous people's rights, uh, biodiversity, and eco-design. So some of the salient risks that I referred to in the beginning. Um, the rule books establish a compliance regulatory baseline. So they allow the companies along the value chain to be compliant with uh, relevant regulation in the EU, the EU battery regulation and others, of course. But reflecting the GBA's global nature, uh, we don't stop at the EU, but we've also included key regulations from other jurisdictions, such as the United States and China and several producing nations as well. Furthermore, we don't stop at uh, compliance. We go beyond compliance by integrating into the reporting framework relevant voluntary sustainability standards with the idea that this helps companies continuously improve their uh, sustainability performance. On some issues on the value chain, this landscape of standards um, is already relatively developed, especially 
for the mining part, the upstream part. Um, it was interesting this morning to listen to the discussion on gigafactories and how there was a lot of talk about um, needing to secure um, social acceptance um, and stakeholder consultation. Well, those of you familiar with mining, that has been a standard practice and a requirement in that industry for decades. So actually, there is a lot that can be learned between different actors along the value chain in terms of sustainability practices. On the other hand, there are other elements of the value chain that are less developed in terms of uh, standards. The end of life, circularity, recycling being one of them, which is, by the way, I'm very much looking forward to the panel next, so hopefully you'll stay for that one as well. Um, and on these issues, the GBA membership is really driving uh, the global movement to set performance expectations on these issues. Um, so as I've already alluded to, um, in the GBA, the rule books are developed um, or co-created in working groups that are open to all of our members. Um, and they really uh, leverage the expertise of the diverse membership and the different perspectives. And this is what allows the rule books and the indicators eventually to strike the right balance between being ambitious, but also being realistic and implementable. So, I don't think I'm going to uh, bore you with too much uh, PowerPoint uh, animations at this point of an afternoon, but uh, just to highlight once more that at the GBA and with our passport, we really aim to build a, um, an ecosystem that is open to working with uh, different providers of technology uh, to actually aggregate and verify the battery passport data. Um, and at the GBA, our role is to then compile this data from multiple passports into a global sustainability performance database um, and to issue an ESG score, um, three-dimensional quality seal for the battery. And with the idea that in the hands of consumers, this data can help them demand for more responsible practices throughout the value chain. And we will also not uh, just issue these scores once, but we will also dynamically keep on um, improving the rule books and the indicators as we collect more data on what the actual practices in the industry look like, what best practice looks like, and also as regulation um, develops. So, to recap, to those of you who may have joined in the last minute or so, the Global Battery Alliance is a multi-stakeholder and pre-competitive global alliance driving sustainable performance across the battery value chain. The GBA's battery passport is a reporting framework for transparency and uh, performance on sustainability going beyond compliance. And finally, the passport is a technology agnostic um, framework inviting all providers to work with us. So as I mentioned, um, looking ahead, we will be busy at work um, developing new rule books, new indicators, defining what sustainability means, and we'll also be launching new, uh, a new wave of pilots, which can already deliver immediate value to participants of those pilots. So I'd just like to conclude by saying Follow us on social media, get in touch with us, and ultimately join us to shape the battery passport. Thank you very much. Aisa, thank you so much for your presentation. I think um, your work is so valuable to ensure that the battery industry also adheres to sustainability goals, uh, both uh, from the ecological side, but also from the social side. So thanks again very much, and also for being exactly on time. <laughs> I like that very much as a moderator. So um, there's room for some questions, and they've already been popping up. Um, and maybe we can tie some of them together, because as usual, we only have five minutes. Um, uh, some of the questions refer to the issue of how you are collaborating or interacting with other systems and other players 
Uh, for example, how do you communicate with other open source solutions? Katina X has been mentioned as one example. Um, how perhaps is your relationship also to the German Batterie Pass um, and things of that sort? Maybe you could expand on your collaboration with other actors. Please. Absolutely, thank you, and that's a crucial question. So we either have a memorandum of understanding or some of these organizations are already um, our members. And it really builds on this idea that we develop the reporting guidelines in the rule books and then those guidelines can be implemented via these different technological solutions. So that's what I meant by technology agnostic. Um, so I referred to the pilots and indeed there were different uh, open source providers um, that worked on the different value chains to aggregate data, collect data from the different companies in that value chain and create that ESG score. So this is um, what we mean by an open ecosystem. So open to collaboration with, with all of them and already collaborating. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we have another um, very popular question uh, that refers to uh, different uh, key performance indicators, KPIs that you've mentioned um, with, um, in the battery passport. And uh, the question here is why do so many of them seem to refer to the module and the pack uh, and uh, perhaps not to the cell itself. Um, uh, the person that's asking this question supposes that um, there might have to be a need for a CO2 footprint information on the cell if uh, the final pack uh, should be assessed. Uh, could you um, expand on that? Um, that's a fantastic uh, question, I think, that I would like this person to pose in one of these working groups that we are uh, convening to define these indicators, because really what is unique about the GBA battery passport is that it puts together the sustainability performance expectations of all of these different steps along the value chain. We're used to looking at them one by one. What's the carbon footprint of mining, of cell manufacturing, of EV manufacturing? And this is what we need to do to, to put them together. So um, we are absolutely not restricted to any one part, uh, but perhaps the relevance and the exact indicators mm -hmm. shall be slightly different uh, depending on the, mm -hmm. um, on the value chain stage. I see. And uh, talking about restrictions, uh, there's another question here referring to geographical restriction. Um, one of the questions uh, is uh, more specifically Will the passport apply to batteries sold or made in the EU? Um, uh, will batteries from other continents be required to use this as well? From other continents. Continents. So um, this battery passport can be used to comply with the EU battery re regulation, which requires a battery passport for those batteries that are sold in the EU. In other jurisdictions, at the moment, there are no um, stringent requirements for a passport as such. But if they come online, yes, of course, they will be integrated into this framework. But at the moment, in other markets, it will serve more um, for consumer information and for evaluating the sustainability performance uh, and durability of different passports. I see. So does that mean that the passport will not be compulsory? No, in other jurisdictions at the moment, it's not compulsory. If there are other, other knowledge in the room, please correct me, but yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, unfortunately, we're almost at the end, uh, but we can take one more question, and that is about confidentiality. Um, how is the risk of confidential information from the OEMs being addressed within the battery passport? Is that an issue? Yes, of course, data governance is a really critical issue and actually at the moment we are working together with our members and our board to define the exact guidelines and how we approach this issue, but with the idea being that indeed independent verification of the data will then also protect uh, confidentiality and also the data that we will use to um, issue the ESG scores will be aggregated data on a type of battery or a model of battery, not an individual particular battery. So this aggregation will then also um, uh, protect uh, specific information. Furthermore, there will be different tiers of access to different users. Regulators will have a bigger access, of course, um, whereas consumers and um, non-governmental organizations, advocacy groups may want to use this to advance good practices, but they will have 
access to a more aggregated level of information. Perfect. Thank you very much once again for the great presentation and also for taking all the questions.